We really caught uh, the whole um, society, and particularly the government, off guard because uh, they really didn't know who we were. So we would sometimes uh, go into universities, and a student that we had met in the park and had chanting with us and wanted to know more about yoga philosophy or wanted us to introduce it to classmates. So that student would go in and set these programs, although none of the faculty knew about it. And we would go into these places, you know, with Redunga slung over our shoulder, you know, devotional attire, peel out, shave head, the whole thing. And, you know, we would come to 500, 1,000, in one case it was like 3,000 students waiting, you know, for the yoga masters to come and deliver a, a lecture about yoga, you know, yoga philosophy. And so, engage them in doing some kirtan, and uh, then use the blackboard. I mean, of course, I was a master of this, writing all the terms, you know, just like a professor, coming out from all these little terms and things, and people are watching, you see them, they were taking notes, you know. <laughs> Krishna, oh, they're writing all these things down. And then, at the end, we would get books, Again, the same thing. People wanted those books so badly. I mean, maybe because, you know, of communism and everything that happened with the Cultural Revolution, people were living in kind of like a, a spiritual a vacuum, you know, they really didn't have any opportunity. So it was like kind of one of the first chances they had to have something of substance. So one of the first times we did this, and I was, we were, Kusana and myself were kind of against the wall, we had one case, maybe, I don't know, a hundred books with us. And so, we tried to get the students to be orderly and come up, you know, one by one. So we opened the case up and then they all rushed us. <laughs> and we were just, we had, we were pushed against the wall. You know, we were just like, you know, flattened against the wall. And then, goes on and said, so what should we do now? <laughs> So I had to physically, you know, kind of push people away and then kind of give them the books and everything. So there, there was an eagerness, whether they knew exactly what they were, uh, you know, looking for, but they had an interest. So we had a window. And the, the point is, is that, yeah, we took a risk. We didn't know what was going to happen. And... Um, you know, sometimes you just have to depend on Krishna. You, you can't, sometimes you have a tendency to overthink things, you know. Think how exactly, well, first I have to learn the, this, you know, I have to learn the whole, you know, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and I have to become a Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Bhai Baba, and everything else, so then I can preach. But the, many of the early devotees didn't have that facility. They didn't have that luxury of, of knowing all of these things. But the main thing is they had this, uh, this kind of tireless desire to, to please Srila Prabhupada and to take a risk. And by taking a risk, you know, there's, there's great mercy to be found. I mean, Lord Chaitanya and his associates um, they're ready to give mercy if we're ready to surrender to them and to assist them. It's a real simple formula. I mean, how many times have boys asked, how can I make advancement? How many classes have we heard Srimad Bhagavatam class? How can I make advancement? Or how can I, how can I, and all the how can I do these things? But the main, if you just give yourself and uh, ready to take a risk to assist Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, they give a very special kind of mercy. So if someone says, I want to make rapid advancement, no, impatient to make advancement sometimes, right? The quickest way is to, is to please Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda by assisting them 
in spreading Krishna consciousness. So these these little risks um, they go a long way uh, towards making an advancement. So you know, fast track to the present day. Now there are many devotees uh, throughout um, in, in the thousands. Uh, but unfortunately they don't have uh, temples and they don't have a society because that's just the way the country is. It's, it's a communist state, so they don't allow religion. Um, at, at least not after 1949. Before 1949, there were some recognized religions. There was some form of Christianity, there was Buddhism, there was a little bit of Islam, there was Confucianism, and there was Taoism. And so after that, no new religions were allowed to form. Somehow, Hinduism not, never got in there, with the speak of Vaishnavism. So, officially, we're not recognized. We don't have any society. Devotees have no uh, temple to go to. Imagine that. We think, well, should I go to the temple this Sunday? <laughs> Gosh, I'm really busy, you know. It's been a rough week. I can it's Sunday, it's a day of rest, right? I should rest. So you think, well, maybe I'll go maybe I won't. But you think if that was taken away, you couldn't go to the temple. You know, if you couldn't have darshan of the deities, you know, if you couldn't um, hear from qualified teachers, or if you couldn't chant uh, kirtan together, I mean, that would be pretty difficult, would it not? Wouldn't it? Yes. So sometimes we take it for granted. And, um, you know, I think the only way not to fall into that trap, to take it for granted, is if you stay in the fire of, of preaching work, like both Mars have, have said. Um, everyone in their own way can do something. And, and the whole basis, as Prophet says, books are the basis. So somehow or another, if you just give one book get one book into the hands of one other person who presently doesn't have one, it makes this huge difference. What to speak of, you can do several books, or many books. But if every person had that mentality, I know some devotees have the, the mentality, wherever they go, they always carry a book. You know, just maybe just one or two, carry it with them in their car, or their bag, or wherever. But just in case, and you know what happens if you have that mentality where, you know, I want to give a book to someone. Then Krishna starts making these amazing arrangements. Amazing arrangements. You don't even know how it works. In the form of the super soul, he makes these amazing arrangements. Um, Keshe Vardimars was just telling us in Houston that he went somewhere for some... Uh, some, some medical, I think it was somebody to get his throat checked or something. So he was in the office, doctor's office, after he had the little procedure that checked. Nothing was wrong, of course. And then when he went out, one of the, I guess the aides or maybe assistants, nurses or something in the office, of course he was dressed in bright saffron and being effulgent as he is, when this, this person saw him, she said, Who are you? Who are you? And he said, I'm a monk. You know, and then he, and she said, well, why that color? He said, well, and he spoke about, you know, how the color has uh, an effect of, of, you know, pacifying the mind, and all these things he said. And then she said, yes, I can, I can relate with that. And then she showed her fingernails, they were exact same color. <laughs> And then she just started to talk, and she was just friendly. And then, you know, he said, and they, he lamented when they came back, if I would have had a book, 
He said, I could have sold her a whole set of books, you know. And he said, you know, when, when people say that, you know, in general people in North America are not open or not friendly, he said, it's just not true. He's, he, he's, his experiences, there's so many opportunities, and they're much more now than they perhaps were in, in the past. Whatever's happening, you know, consciousness is changing, people are more open, the opportunities are there, but we have to kind of take a little initiative and, and do little things. Carry one book with you, if nothing else. If you have the desire, Krishna does amazing things. So, you don't have to be in the midst of uh, mainland China to like, you know, um, push forward the mission. The mission is wherever we're at. So many of you happen to be right here in Dallas. There's a mission. It's the same mission as it's, as, as it's always been. Um, we just have to take advantage of it. And it's, it's a, a very wonderful opportunity. And it's a fact. You take a little risk. Um, and you try to give Krishna consciousness to others, you feel greatly enlightened. And as Vaisha Sikha Prabhu will say, there is no feeling uh, like giving someone one of the Shiva Prabhupada's books. Someone takes it, it just, it's so gratifying to the heart. So, all of us in our own way should, you know, have our participation in trying to further the mission. Well, now that you asked. <laughs> so I mentioned that um, you know, devotees in, in China, they don't have temples, they don't have a society, they, they have to meet in their homes, apartments, and so on. So there's very little facility. So back in, in the late um, 90s, um, Tamal Krishna Goswami and myself, we were co-GBCs to that region. And we came up with a, an idea, how to better serve those devotees and facilitate their practice of Krishna consciousness. So the idea we came up with was to uh, create um, a self-sustainable community in very close proximity to China. So about an hour, an hour, hour and a half away from mainland China lies the Philippine Islands. It's 7,000 islands, but there's a few main ones. And Strategically, it's a very good location. So we have now been able to kind of begin to realize that dream by uh, acquiring some 25 acres of pristine property in, in the, about two hours away from the major city of Manila. And we're trying to develop an eco-village that really is meant to be like a training and educational facility, primarily for those devotees who can come for whatever amount of time, a week, a month, or longer, for training. You can enjoy temple life, um, have the freedom to practice as a devotee, to wear devotional attire, which I can't really do, and to just experience Krishna consciousness. Um, so we are now in, in, in the present time working on developing this. So if you don't mind, if I could have just about eight more minutes of your time, we'll show you just a very short presentation that Haridas Prabhu has nicely put together for us. As you know, he's originally from Hong Kong, by the way. He's Chinese. <laughs> Sorry. 
He needs two minutes. So as I said, presently there are a few thousand devotees scattered throughout the country. Um, you know it's the largest country, I think, in terms of population in the world, is 1.5 billion people. And um, devotees are uh, quite committed. Calvin, he made some comments. Uh, when, when Small Krishna Goswami couldn't get in for, for whatever reasons in 1976, one of the instructions he gave was to, he said, first let the books enter, and he said, then the, the preaching field will be created. Very interesting thing. Let the books enter first, and then the preaching field will be created. So we put a lot of emphasis on bringing books into China for, for whatever many ways we could figure out in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands and then those books went into China and just by doing that some years later the opportunity came to actually be able to go into China it opened up to enable us to, to go in so an important instruction but it's kind of a universal instruction really. uh, the books create the preaching field just by allowing the books to enter. So it's such an important activity. Thank you. 